Thank you, thank you, TV. Thank you for writing such a such a book. First of all, and uh, I noticed that it took you seven years to write the book, and I know what seven years mean because I presented something that was also seven years here. And uh, but there's a difference between my seven years and your seven years, in the sense that I spent a lot of those seven years in the country that I was reporting. Your book has that major problem. That this is a very, very serious indictment of a state, its people, and more importantly, its military. There could not be a more indictment of a state than this book. This presentation is not what is reflected in the book, and I thank the US government for giving me a, such a ticket that I have to sit in that back seat. I can't <laughs> upgrade. There was nothing else for me to do in 24 hours but to finish this book. So I flagged all this, but I won't really go into a couple of those points here. Um, you know, this book, you know, made me first of all think that you know, if you want to really pose a question as to why do dates don't grow in Bangkok, or why do tropical fruits don't grow in Saudi Arabia, this is the problem that a large number of ideas, and given on social science, is even applied to a country, which is so easy to criticize. The easiest country in the world to criticize today is Pakistan because there are a lot of flaws and the flaws are very, very appropriately brought out in this book. But all of these books are from secondary sources. Now I'm going to tell you something that if this book is picked up in Pakistan, TV, I'll tell you, again let me qualify like you did, I'm not defending Pakistan here, like you are not speaking for India. And neither I just happen to be former Pakistan military, so I'm not defending that, but I happen to know the military more than that. Now, the first thing that a Pakistani would look in is your list of acknowledgement here. That's the first thing they're going to read. Everybody who has reviewed your book is not a single Pakistani. That's not true. Or a single, you know, that's, that's what I'm reading here. Not a single Pakistani author or a scholar even in this acknowledgement who has seen this book. My name comes on the second page in a very different context because of a, of a conference here. So that's going to be the first observation, whether you meant it or not, but I'm just giving you what it is, you know. So it's all about opinion done in a very, very scholarly manner. And those sources that you have actually cited in this book are the ones that have been written elsewhere. What you did is you put it together in a very, very different way, you know. There are other books on Pakistan that have been very recently, a couple of years. One book is called Pakistan, a Hard Country by Anatol Levin, where at least he spent a lot of years in, in that country. Another one by uh, edited volume by Dr. Malia Lodi, Pakistan Beyond the Crisis State, all talks about these things that you have mentioned in the book. But they actually give a different stories if you read the whole thing. And just now, uh, when I was coming, there's another book released by IISS Institute of Strategic Studies by Mark Fitzpatrick about what? Dealing with the dangers of Pakistan nuclear weapons, something like that. So a lot of books are actually coming which are reflective of some of the things that you have said. But let me tell you something that um, you showed that map, if you, if you don't mind showing that British map, will actually give you a lot of insight. Here is a country that was created only 66 years ago that you mentioned. But what was the state of the country in this map? Look at, the, look at the periphery, the country that belongs now. This became part of the British Empire very late in the British century. The heart of the British Empire was right inside India. That society that constitutes Pakistan today is agrarian, tribal, no history of democracy, no bureaucracy in its history. Even the railway lines and communication system grew very late. The Everything across the river industry, if you slant the country halfway, everything west bordering Afghanistan was absorbed in the British Empire just about 50 years before it, before it became independent. There are tribal people out there. NWFE was absorbed in Punjab in 1901. The disputes with Pakistan predates even its existence. Nobody knew this country will come. The Duran line with Afghanistan is 1893. And of course, the border with India, of course, we didn't even go into the details. Everybody knows what it is. So if you look into all these things and look at the kind of, and the ethnic cleavages, the sectarian cleavages, which you very rightly point out, your, your chapter on religious and religion sector is very, very powerful 
and I, I would will agree with religion and politics. I will have no comment on that. Uh, of course, I mean there is a little more simplification, which which other scholars would probably tell you. But I'll speak more on the strategic things that you've talked about here. So now, when you look into all these factors, it's very it's it's a question that comes to the mind: What else would you expect this country to do other than what it is doing? And that is something that you know. What more do you expect? They will exactly do. So I don't know your your scholar sitting here, Jeff, Jessica. You can talk more about. But this is a country that really acts with realist impulse. It is not an idealist country. Emmanuel Kant is not known to these people. That's why I'm wondering. Well, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's a fair pity. It's going to be very hard for them to become a conscious state. They will, they are, they're embedded in Hobbesian. But I do take some of the comments which are in the book, which will be very, very, which is, will be taken very offensive uh, by people in Pakistan, if you don't mind my saying but some no, of the no, words. No, I'm getting very positive response from many Pakistanis. No, no. Well, I'm telling you there's not a positive thing. I'm going to say that. But here is something that I read here. And a lot of people in this center are knows that. Pakistan is a great example of a garrison strait mm -hmm. with military ethos deeply ingrained in its society Absolutely. It's, and its culture. Now, here is a lady sitting here from Pakistan. There are many more who have been here. You know. Is that a deeply ingrained society in its culture? It's the, the manner in which the book indicates is that there are inherently people who are just willing to just fight and do nothing else. That's the re reflection that comes in the book and you know, Saadiya's smile that indicates. You know. And then this, the other theme that comes out, because I'll shift more to the security part, because I have a lot, lot more to say because what you just said. Now, you do mention that, you do mention in your presentation in your book elsewhere that you're not absorbing India's role in Pakistani state of behavior. But it doesn't really come out. The intensity with which the Pakistani state considers that and has a historical narrative to explain why it does behave. Now, recently I've been doing a lot of exercises myself and I'm dealing with my Indian colleagues and friends and all. There is this theme from India that comes across and very lately Bill and I were there. India is a Nairobian, Gandhian, disarmament, you know, peaceful, non-aligned country that doesn't do anything wrong. Everybody next to India is a terrible guy, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Everybody is bad. We are the only good guys around in the middle. We don't do anything. And therefore, you know, and here very recently the presentation that was made by the Indian team and one of the exercises I did was India does fight war only to buy peace. It doesn't fight war for any other reason. Think about with whom they're fighting, how will they react? And your book actually indicates a very interesting thing which, which really struck me. The Indian military victory in 1971 generated temporary period of calm in the subcontinent. Wow. The military defeat was not decisive enough as in the case of Germany and Japan in 1945. Anybody reading that would clearly indicate, my God, this 66 years later, the country is still thinking of defeating me decisively. And 110 nuclear weapons are not sufficient because the concept... I'll observation on that. I, I will get time. I'm just using the theory of yeah. preponderance as a peace preserver. I'm not advocating that. Okay, okay I'm just reading so, what... Overwhelming <laughs> preponderance can preserve peace. Yeah. There's an argument in uh, IR literature. Much of my writing is from IR inside. So you, if you're not familiar with IR inside, you'll find it very offensive. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not finding it offensive. I'm just showing you another contradiction that you do 20 pages later. Then you say that military generate threats to create myths. Now, but this is a contradiction here in itself. I mean, by the way, there's no military in the world that I know that does not exaggerate the threat of its neighbor. I mean, think about um, the more well, there was let me disagree. You're going too far. I'm going to disagree with you decisively on that point. A lot of militaries then don't do the kind of thing Pakistani military does. Don't go beyond that. I would say. Anyway, you continue. Okay. So, but that's that's what my take is because I said I know the military more than that. So let me go and come to some of the other points that I do agree with you on that. Uh, your comparison is kind of a very bland comparison between South Korea. Taiwan. Well, I wish any other country in the world would have that kind of an umbrella or even physical f sitting of US forces to defend against them. That's amazing that you made. 
Egypt neighbors Israel. Pakistan neighbors India and Afghanistan and China. So, you know, I mean, there is much more to the comparisons that you make. Now, you made Indonesia's comparison very interesting in terms of policy. I take that, that Indonesian security policy has changed. But again, look at the location. You're talking about a country with 13,000 archipelago compared to this country with this geography and location. You, you got, to, got to really think about what, what, what it is. So let me come to two more points because there are a lot more points you mentioned about strategic depth and strategic parity. Yeah, strategic depth and strategic parity that you mentioned. And let me just talk about these two concepts because I've lived with these two concepts all my service there. The notion of strategic depth vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan that you mentioned has been a very abused term both in the literature that scholars have put it. And in fact, it was loosely mentioned by one military leader that, was, that did not have any serious consideration in the Pakistani military thought process. Now grant me that much I know. I may not know that literature, but this much I know. The idea of a buffered state or a vassal state was a British idea. You correctly point that out. That was not a Pakistani idea. The problem with Afghanistan was the porous border and the question that they really questioned the very state itself and wanted half of the portion to be part of that. That very question. And plus, the manner in which this idea was you know, encouraged and fueled at the time of partition and continues to be fueled. So Afghanistan becomes a second front vis-a-vis -vis India as you look at the geography, which is their fundamental problem. And you gone into the detail, but that was not the strategic depth notion in a military sense. So if you are indicating that there, in a geopolitical sense that Pakistani quest to have a friendly or a quest to have at least a neutral government in Kabul is a fair geopolitical assessment and that is, I'm afraid, no matter how many, how many Emmanuel Kant can come to Pakistan, it's not going to go away. That's their compulsion because of the nature of geography and the intertwined nature of the people of that country. That's not going to go away. So sorry, I can't do this. Help you. I don't think Pakistani will be able to help that. Now, you move a very interesting terminology about strategic parity about, and, and your book is, is, comes across a lot. I partially agree with your assessment here on this question of strategic parity, but not fully. It's not about state status, it's more about the historical explanation which you just gave in a while, short while ago. It is about strategic balancing. And strategic balancing is not equal to strategic parity. If the country does not balance against India, it's gone. It knows what happened in 71. It knows how the Indian military exercises every summer. It sees the modernization, it sees the acquisitions, it sees the posturing. That is not a myth. They exercise every day and that is where the fear does not go away. But your point about that an absence of middle class in Pakistan is a valid point, which is where these heavily military dominated thinking might dilute over a period of time. But there's a lot more than simply turning from a national security state, which you are correctly, uh, you're correctly pointing out, it will not transform into a trading state because of a wide variety of reasons that exist there. And that includes, that includes India as well, which means that India has to do a lot more to help its neighbor also become a trading state. After all, Pakistan lives in the neighborhood of an India that has not resolved any problem with any of its neighbors, big or small, including China, including B Bangladesh and other countries. So there are, there's a lot more uh, trading issues than is, no, is known to the people because it's not that easy to simply just give an MFN status and things are going to go. A lot of hard work is going on and things are changing in, in that part of the world. So uh, I'll stop here. I've got a lot more points to say, but no. Let's I'm going to ask you to show a little restraint. <laughs> <laughs> Chopping at the bit to, I to respond. Have, I do have for respond for all those points, but I will control myself. Yes, but uh, we have other people in the room who sat uh, very patiently. And by the way, next week we're going to take on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian oh, uh, relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Soft that too. Um, so, um, just uh, anybody who has has questions, raise your hands, uh, and we'll call people. So um, please identify for yes, my and, yeah, for for TV I never hear. So maybe Sadi, I will start. Sorry. I'm Sadia Singh, I'm lecturer at the Department of Defense and Strategic Studies at Kailasan University, and currently I'm a visiting 
Ricardo here has seen it. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't read your book, but this is a very interesting presentation, and I look forward to reading the book as soon as possible. I just have a, a one or two questions on <clears throat> on uh, your presentation. So you might have addressed them in the book, but uh, just for the sake of understanding. Um, so uh, I thought that you were discussing a causal relationship between uh, the, between, uh, the military uh, uh, investments uh, in, in the idea of war making and Pakistan's problems as a state on Pakistan being the first state. I didn't really get to see the evidence or how you actually prove that it's uh, that Pakistan becoming a weaker state is actually a consequence of its investments in in war making and uh, uh, why I see it as a very problematic issue is because uh, I thought we treated Pakistan's history with a broad brush. Uh, there are different decades in Pakistan's history that do reflect different realities of Pakistan. So if you look at 1960s, Pakistan was a very vibrant state with a growing economy and uh, during President Ayub's era we get to see development and, um, and, and a lot of other stuff. If we look at, uh, at uh, Zafir Ali Bhutto's era, we get to see that it was probably uh, less about military and more about feudal challenges that he couldn't really deliver on his promises with land reforms and all that stuff. And then we get to see uh, Jan Zia's era where it's the Cold War and Pakistan's involvement into that which makes Pakistan, which turns Pakistan into an altogether different direction and we get to see the problems of that kind of policy today. And go and into all those things in detail when you get to the book. Okay, right. So, but what exactly is, uh, how exactly do you prove that? And then we look at Musharraf Sira, you talk about uh, education or lack of investment in education. We uh, saw a general uh, assuming power and then investing a lot of energy into like the idea of uh, educating people, uh, the constitution of uh, higher education commission and then uh, a lot of emphasis on science and technology. Of course, it's a gradual process and it has yet to develop, but then it was a military, it, it was an army general who thought that it turned into a president who thought that he really needs to invest in, uh, in, in these kinds of uh, things as opposed to just investing in military uh, development. So how do you establish the fact that it's the military development which has actually, uh, actually caused all the challenges for Pakistan? Probably there are a lot of other issues. Yeah, I think it's better you read the book before some of these things <laughs> I answer. And anyway, we'll come to that. So yeah, you have more people. Do you want to take more questions? Maybe one or two. Okay. okay. Well, on the side. Afternoon. Thank you both for your comments. My name is Mark Renekamp, and I'm a uh, student here in the Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Program. And I'd like to uh, get your opinion on, on the role of the Taliban in, in Pakistan's future. Um, there was a recent article in the, in the New York Times by Carlota Gall. I'm sure you gentlemen have read it. Um, that alluded to uh, direct kind of protection by the elements of the Pakistani security forces for um, some of these radical schools. Uh, the question is, do, do you see the Taliban as kind of this Frankenstein that's gotten out of control, or is there some utility still for, for Pakistan, for the government, elements of the government to utilize the Taliban in the future? Let me, uh, that last question I leave to Feroz because he knows more about Taliban than I am. <laughs> but Feroz, I, let me start off by saying that you, ne you need to read the book a second time. First time when you read, you're going to be offended. Because the book is meant to provoke you, Feroz, people like you. Because as long as you don't take it personally or physically, then fine. You know. <laughs> my, my effort here is to, I was trying to do a soft landing on this book. And the more I read about it, the history, the interactions, the military history, the IR literature that talks about conflict and conflict situation, I could not do a, a soft landing. And much of your criticism is that it was by Destiny, it was in this context, your strategic context, it was history, you know that. I don't disagree with all that, but all I'm saying is that countries facing such difficult situations have done well, exactly not the same situations, by adopting different strategies. And Pakistan itself has done that in the 50s and up to 
in the late 60s. And so the question is, it's a path-dependent decline of a state that had great potential. And to blame it on outsiders, first of all, I disagree fundamentally that that is only part of the story, and that if only outsiders become all uh, saints and nice give concessions to us, then we change. That's exactly the idea many Pakistani elite talk about. Pakistan will never change because the outsiders are no, they are not philanthropists. They are going to fight for their, whatever they consider. I do not return this book to prop up India's case. That is unfair on your part. I'm one of the supporters of Pakistan or Pakistani middle class. In fact, I have people who listen to my talk come to me and say in private, I agree with you, but you cannot say all these things. So I would encourage you to reread. And I have written this book in 200 pages as much I can draw from literature, of course, you have access to them, but you just mentioned one book, Mr. Levin. You must have seen the criticism he is getting in the Pakistani uh, uh, society and elite. One of them is that he's really sugarcoating the whole thing. He goes there, he gets, you know, Pakistanis and Indians are excellent hosts. They hug you, they give you best food, and you have to, if you have to return to get all the tribal news, then you have to really toe the line. Levin's book is a disappointment for us, whether you like it or not. He could have done a fantastic job in explaining this country and its pathologies that are unfortunately not helping it. Now, let us go one by one as much as I can. Your argument. Can we see if you have any questions before you do the detailed rebuttal? Is that okay? <laughs> I want to make sure anybody else, if you wanted to get in, let's, uh, bef before TV and for us get up another head of Steve, here's your chance. Any other, well, let's take yours. Any other what time we end, by the way? We end at 1.45. Okay. Yes. I, just, I wanted to make more of an observation that I think part of this, sorry, Jessica Pembo from the Naval Postgraduate School, as a comparative politics scholar who's moved into the international security field, I can see exactly what your part of what your dispute is which is an area specialist versus a comparativist. So part of this is innate in your different different perspectives. So you're coming in with a theoretical question, which is why doesn't war make state, state makes war work in Pakistan? Because it should be a, a crucial case for it, given that it's been almost in a state of war for its entire existence. This is a state where this argument should have worked, but didn't. And so you have sort of, I haven't read it, I'm assuming shadow cases based on Taiwan and South Korea and Israel, which also have external threats that led to stronger state making in their cases where external threat did not in Pakistan. So I think you didn't, That's the, when you presented it, that wasn't as crystal clear as it could have been, which is part of your sort of um, protection against Feroz's argument, which is your too light on Pakistan history, you don't understand the culture, you haven't been there, and so you can't write about it. Um, the book, book, the common, let me, let me uh, complete. But, the, the book but, does do that, okay? Every right. chapter okay. talks about the history mm -hmm. connecting to a central theme. So. Right. so the question in there is, are you saying that the geostrategic curse is the reason why the mechanism of war and state making doesn't work? Not alone. Combined okay. with that, strategies and ideas of the elite. By the way, I have nothing against the people of Pakistan, you know. My qualms with the elite decision-making units, those are the ones who made choices over the last 66 years. And they are driven by a set of ideas and conceptions that don't give room for developmental ideas enough, okay. They, they will say they occasionally they do, like Musharraf did occasionally. So the, the linking of uh, structural and, uh, and ideational variable is what I'm doing. Without that, uh, this will be yet another discussion of, you know, structural variables determining uh, Pakistan's fate. That's not quite correct. So, my effort here is to show different dimensions where the war and state make making have not worked out and the reasons for that. So the book, book goes into it. Presentation, I, this presentation is meant for different kinds of audiences. So, some are general public, some are academic, so I cannot include everything in 45 minutes, so, but your point is well taken. That's exactly for us. This is a theoretical excursion using the literature that many of you are not familiar with in the Pakistani military or uh, civil society. And that literature is contested in a big way in the war making state building. And so this is an excellent case for somebody. And my question is why nobody has done it yet? 
Um, some other books are coming out. Akhil Shah apparently has something interesting. So it is, uh, it is not meant to discredit the country, but it's testing a big puzzle. And that puzzle shows that pivotal choices made during periods of time that include civilians like Bhutto and the policies initiated have not led to the progression that we look in a positive relationship between war and state making. So, so TV, I have a question. Sure, please. So there's going to be an Indian election very soon. That's a good question. It's underway now, actually. Um, so let's, let's imagine that uh, after the election, uh, the new Indian government comes to power and they invite you to Delhi to give a briefing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, based on what you concluded in the book, what policy recommendations would you make for a new Indian government to, to do what it can to, to assist Pakistan to get out of this predicament? I do worry the Indian government will do some negative things which are going to hurt the relationship. Uh, going by the BJP's first few years in the last time, they already declared that they will abandon the first use policy. So I think it will be a crucial mistake because that will give more incentive to Pakistan's to pop up its doctrine and argument that we need the first use. So, if at all there was, a, uh, unlike what my mom said, that we need a regime for the first use. So that one. They will do a few uh, saber rattling to show to China, to Pakistan, you know, we are a tough state. All that is not going to be read there same way as in India. They think that it's a domestic politics driven argument, you know. So, so, but on the other hand, if Modi ever wants to make India a great power, as I guess that's one of his dreams, then he has to somehow at least uh, contain the kind of rivalry that with Pakistan and to some extent with China. So I have a feeling that he may turn around, but maybe after a few, a short period of uh, saber rattling. It also depends on what, what kind of majority he would get. And the other question is whether it will affect the internal dynamics of India, the Hindu-Muslim relationship. What is he going to do in Kashmir? A lot of these variables are unpredictable. But what is, uh, it, to his credit, or to BJP's credit, they haven't started the temple business as they did in the past round. They have realize that some of them, they have the potential to become a right-wing alternative to the Congress party or whatever coalition. And that if they do a good uh, economic progress, then maybe they have a chance to get re-elected as an alternative. But they have elements within them, like the RSS and a certain percentage. They may start tinkering with the textbooks and stuff like that. It is disturbing that one. So, I am ambivalent and, and worried to a great extent. But on the other hand, that is not an excuse for restarting the negotiations. They are back channel. They've done quite a bit of uh, achievements. But um, somebody has to really tie the knot. And here, I think the BJP may be a better bet than Congress fellows are, honestly. It's like the Israeli writing uh, you know, liquid. So like most, this guy, um, I watched by him into Lahore. But as I have written recently a piece that there are too many peace spoilers in South Asia. You have these uh, groups that will, obviously some come from Pakistan with the ISI's help, as the Mumbai and uh, all that. But in India too there are, and so all you need is one attack somewhere, and then that is enough to derail this process that has been building up. But there are enough uh, sensitivities and desire for some kind of a rapprochement, even in Pakistan, from whatever I understand from some of the elites thinking. But uh, desire is one thing that are there structural conditions ready for peace? Or are elite willing to stand up when there are spoilers coming into the ground? So we have to wait and see. Okay, what kind of majority he gets is another issue. Any guests with, with questions or comments that. Uh, how about if you take five minutes to reply to some selected points that Burroughs made? I, 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 I want to answer, Burroughs, you need to read this book again. Without, without uh, you, act, you, you read it as a Pakistani army nationalist, basically. I'm not telling you that. You're not that. I know you very well. You are a nice man, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you have an opportunity to pick up some of these themes. I don't mind you criticizing intellectually. Don't say that he has all this acknowledgement, you know, only Hindus I acknowledge. It doesn't matter at all. The face doesn't matter. The, the messenger doesn't matter. It's like telling the American Jew, you are not an Arab, so you cannot do any Arab studies. 
In fact, the best books are written by American Jewish scholars. No, no, I didn't say that. No, I'm just saying that's the understanding. No, I have to, I have to speak here. Mm. I didn't say that. I said in any acknowledgement that you have done, yeah. there's not a single Pakistani. Yeah, I can't bring religion in here. Okay. No, no, no. It's, listen. I, I, is that right? I have if talked. To, not right, then I it's... have talked to a lot of folks at your track two meeting. That's my source. I don't want to list them. You don't understand. I've interacted with them and exchanged notes with them. Okay, I have tons of notes. Okay. But I don't want to put them and put them in a bad situation, including you. Because I don't want to make them feel like they are giving me ideas. You know, are, you, know you know how the situation works. Okay. Talking to Pakistan, it's not entirely true. I had four of the Pakistani scholars visiting my uh, my uh, fall seminar. Aisha Siddiqui came, Akani came, and two other. And they have uh, interacted with them so intensely in, in discussing some of these themes. So I don't think, um, and the two people who, by the way, gave me blurbs, they read it too. The, the early penalty made at least, and one or two comments came from them. That's not a very good reason for you to criticize me because I am one of the few people coming origin in Indian origin. I don't have any qualms about you know, the Indian sensitivities. This book is not written for India. I wanted to focus on Pakistan, otherwise it will dilute the whole message. It's a very focused understanding of a country and testing a theoretical puzzle. Okay? You can do another book. And within 200 pages, a trade book, I had to condense a lot of literature. And that is why people like it, that it doesn't have the wordiness to which uh, most academic books, books do. So my, my effort was very genuinely interested in helping Pakistan, honestly. But you got a diagnosis. If I have a cancer, I cannot say that, you know, I, you guys are not looking at me fairly nicely. Maybe a lot of reasons for I have a little bit of cancer. Maybe it is the lifestyle I led or the kind of approach I have. I smoke too much, then what can I do? You know, I, I did part of myself. That is what we need to reflect. The strategic circumstances absolutely was there. I covered it a lot. The history is covered in a very, as much as I can, but I don't want to claim the ultimate authority on I am not. I am just an IR comparative theorist with as much I can, but I want to apply my little knowledge to this region. Now, I did an interview in Pakistan, and I have read those interview books, and say I'm not happy, Levin is one of them. Let me, let me give me a chance. Um, your discussion of Afghan, Pakistan's Afghan policy is a bankrupt one. Tell you why. From day one, of course, they didn't approve. I mean, how would they approve? Their territory, the Pashtuns were divided by the, uh, by the British, the, the line. And, and yes, all those are historical facts. But the biggest question is, if the Afghan, what do the Afghan people want? Does Pakistani elite ever think of that? They want to be a normal people, a normal society without interference by neighbors. Now we can say India interferes, Russia interferes. But Pakistan is not a friend of Afghanistan for almost all of it, other than a few Pashtuns or the Taliban types. It's unfortunate that the Pakistani strategy has not befriended this country. Instead, it has been treating it like a vassal state, try to keep it weak. And whatever you say, Indians did that, the, you know. And even today, the, the question was very appropriate. Are, is Pakistan going to abandon the Pakistan Taliban? I mean, Afghan Taliban or not? If not, what are we talking about? It's going to blow back on Pakistan. And it's going to destroy whatever semblance you talk about, the peace and security. So let us not try to continue. This. Well, why not a new strategy to think about Afghanistan? Maybe talk to them. Maybe allow this government to continue to uh, you know, achieve some kind of peace. But I talked to some Indians too, and they said, we have a plan B too, what the heck is that? Plan B is, you know, uh, we know that uh, the ISI will not keep quiet, they will do stuff, so we will have to respond. What does that mean? What do you, you know, this is the time for a great rapprochement in the region, including the Afghan, they have done a decent election as far as we know. So I, I don't agree with the thing you said about Pakistan's corrupt Afghan policy. It needs to go change, it is based on hyper real political understanding, drawing from the British ideas, and of course the regional context. I just did a book on status in world politics, so I'm doing a lot more on this subject of india Pakistan conflict, India-China conflict, India-US rivalry. Status appears definitely a major uh, thing. You mentioned India has improved, so India has done pretty well with Bhutan, Sri Lanka, I think, especially on the trade side, and Bangladesh increasingly, and Nepal to some extent with uh, some but yeah, I mean, it's very clear that India's policy is very much Brahminical. And you know, a lot of, I am going to write another book on India, but it will be much harsher. In fact, I was telling yesterday, 
It is about uh, this craving for status. You know, status is pushing me to think about it. They're sending uh, rockets to Mars, can't fi fix any roads or any, you know, locals. So I was at Stanford yesterday, and my wife's uh, cousin is Thomas Kailak, who's an electrical engineering dean and all that. He was kind of disputing, we need high tech too. I said, well, we need roads too, you know. In my low voice, because he's kind of a big guy, I don't want to find him. <laughs> he connects connected to all the atomic energy, all the biggies. So my uh, sensitivity here is that our elite in South Asia are driven by a lot of antiquated ideas. Let us be blunt about it in whatever way we can, because I have a tenured job, luckily I'm safe. But um, it is very important that we cannot just pluck it and say, you know, this thing is great, that thing is great. Unless you are coming to present a strong argument, you won't even react. You know, if I had a very soft argument, you would be happy and gone home. Now you reacted, which is my effort, my, my idea. I want you to react and then think about it, but not pull out all the micro elements. It's a macro big picture book. And if you pull out all the micro elements, you know, I can't say everything I have just if I, I, I have found out all the, all the... There are a lot of books coming out on that subject. But the fundamental causes of state and war and the fundamental evolution of a state needs to be looked into the big picture IR comparative. We have a lot to offer. Our people don't pay any attention to this region. we we'll do IR and comparative especially. So I'm one of the, I think, one of the rare people to do that. And I would like to encourage younger scholars to do that more. I don't mind a counter thesis, theory driven argument to this book, or testing this in other cases, or disproving me, fine. But the point I would say that this is a major element of Pakistan's lack of innovation, transformation, that crises are not opportunities for change because there's always somebody coming over, because we cannot let it go. That's the India in 1991. Without that crisis, India would be a basket case. The Indian elite had to collect all the gold from the Reserve Bank of India and only $1 billion in reserve, by the way, to pay the debt service and take it to London at, at midnight, a very humiliating experience. Then they come back and said, oh, we've got to do something about it. Here the problem is, so that he told uh, visiting American uh, uh, Secretary of State or somebody, we are your layman brothers. Imagine if we go down, what happens? This argument is so powerfully used. Uh, to not to do the major transformation, economic transformation needed to build a um, uh, kind of uh, uh, trading state. I do not believe at a minute that Pakistan cannot become a trading state. You had a history of trade in the, with India too before 65 war, a lot more trade was going on. And the Pakistanis living abroad and you know there's so many of them are so good in this sort of economic activity. And so it is the grand strategy that countries follow. They have a lot of justification for that. But that grand strategy ought to change if you want to become... Now that's where I make it very clear that I'm not questioning Pakistan's claim on Kashmir or anything. All I'm saying is that don't wait for the other guys to do all the concessions for you to innovate and change. And so, sir, please read it with uh, compassion and, and think that I am your friend, not your enemy in this book. So will you be eating grass on your next plane? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of that book. I'm, I've been a sympathetic to your book. Uh, okay. We could maybe take one more question, if, if anybody else wants to ask a question. Yeah, Ray. My, I'm Raymond Zelanskis. I direct the Chemical and Biological Weapons non proliferation Program here at CMS. Uh, about four years ago, I was uh, at the OPCW in The Hague, and I uh, was visiting, and I met the people there, of course. And then uh, this Pakistani uh, official invited me for lunch. So I had lunch with him. And the reason I invited me, he knew I came from Honor Institute. And he wanted to discuss his, he, his tour was up at the Hague. So he was returning to Pakistan. And uh, what he wanted to talk to me about was uh, something that really, really concerned him. And he was explaining to me that what, he cons what concerned him was that the level of education was so low in Pakistan and that the government was not uh, investing enough in the education. And he says, on the other hand, there was a lot of money going into uh, uh, setting up these uh, madrasas, and, and there were more and more of them, and they were educating a completely different kind of population than the public schools in Pakistan. So he wanted to get something going that would help 
the public school system there. Mm -hmm. And now you're telling me that in, I don't know, how long, not too distant future, there are going to be 300 million, 300 million Pakistanis. And they're going to put in less than 1% into the education system. I think it's more than that now. Is it, is it for us to, about 2.5%? 2, 2 okay, but very little. And see, what you see is this imbalance that this man was talking about. It's going to get even worse. Mm -hmm. And what does Pakistan looks future look like if you have 300 million people and their young people have been mostly educated in madrasas? I mean, that just scares the <laughs> hell out of me. That's what I, I, and you know, what they should do is start 100 engineering colleges straight away. Now you can say we won't get teachers here. You know, try to bring people like Faroz or his people here, give them secure uh, quarters and, you know, money, whatever. Set up at least 30, 40 uh, special economic zones. The Chinese should come and invest, or international investors. They need to start somewhere. The problem is, it's all, you know, blame game is going on for so long. It's initiatives you do with your own backyard, and that will change this country. I think uh, maybe you can respond to what he's saying about this lack of investment in technical education, especially. And liberal arts, too. You know, the history lessons are very, unfortunately, very developed in that part of the system. So, May I say something? Yeah. It looks like that I've written the book and system. Okay. <laughs> it's not quite like that. Okay, um, I qualify that I cannot take the label away that I was a former military officer. So I did not want to qualify anything other than that. I indicated to you how a possible response would come because really my first question was who's the audience of your book you qualify? You know, it's just like targeting policy, you know. You're trying to target some other audience, but actually it's being received by somebody else. That's okay. That's what I'm indicating to you, that this is going to be read by somebody else, but this is the kind of reaction you're going to get because this is what it comes across. And I'll read it ten times, I'll know that I'll come across the same point again. Because your prejudice against me as a person. No, 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 no. For God's sake. Whatever I, I even if I caught the cited that 20 more Pakistanis, you say the same thing because you're not going to look at me as no, a... No, no, I, you have cited, I read the book. Obviously. You have cited a lot of people whom you have met and you know they're all good friends of mine. You've cited that in the book and they will respond whether what they, what... You have quoted so let's in move on from that point to the next point because that point I don't agree with you. And I'm not worried about it, honestly. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> let me just pick up your next response. Here. Okay, so let's let's bring to this point to an end. You know. Okay. But the the point was that this book was an indictment of the Pakistan military. Therefore, I essentially responded to that. There are many other fact, uh, facets in the book that TV has presented here, and the question that you were asked, I I agree with that. It's not just TV has written, but he has sourced those very things which have been said earlier. So there's nothing new that has been said about. The question that you asked and the question that you asked is part of that. I'm not defending that. But by the way, that uh, in the article, there's a response by Peter Bergen. If you read it, I don't know where it is. But he was targeting the Bin Laden portion, which was blown out of well, you know, the No, 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 no. He's, he's talking about that. That's one part of the right. thing. That was the main indictment. Right. And that's a very huge indictment that the president and the chief of the army and everybody knew where he was lying. What more allegation can you give? And that's coming five years later or four years later? Or what has she been sleeping over for three years? Living there? Why did she come out now? And why is the entire US government quiet about that if that's an indictment? So it's a, it's a very specific sort of a thing. You know. My question is that when you reach a very specific conclusion which indicts people, state, and something, you've got to be very sure about it. That's my only question about whether it is social science or whichever science it is. You've got to be very sure what you're saying about it. And that's my only, only problem here. But I think the central message of this book, that the state of Pakistan needs to find a different set of statecraft, that it needs to change the strategy, I think that's the first thing I would have agreed with you always. And by the way, <laughs> by the way, no, I, want to, I want to say this on record. I hope you're recording this. <laughs> T. Paul's book on enduring rivalry has been a must read in my classroom for last, since 2005 it came, it continues even today. There's nothing about you and your scholarship. No, I, I, I you know, and many of the arguments you have made in my conference, which are, which at the time you are writing this book, I supported your argument. But you I are the only not, one supported me. No, I, I, believe, <laughs> I believe what you are saying is, 
But I still say this is a very Immanuel Kant idea. Yes. It's not going to turn. I am on becoming that. a Kantian. It's a very Kantian idea that's not going to happen as, as very quickly. We should try, that's all I'm saying. And my second point is that in his point that Pakistani national security state is military dominated security thinking, I'm one person who would agree with TV Paul on that. In fact, without your saying, I've been saying this all along. Mm -hmm. Sadia, you may remember when, I, when my book was launched in Islamabad, bulk of the question was this, and what was my response to that? I mean, it's not that I said that. I've been saying this in Islamabad, they don't like me for this. But I've been saying that this is a heavily security-dominated state, and more nuclear weapons are not going to give you more security. You're going to change your track towards a different thing, because now you have the ultimate deterrence. If eating grass doesn't give that message, I've failed to the phone it pages, something similar to what you have said. So I do not have any quarrel on that. I have a question about something else that I mentioned. The micro details, which are, you know, I can't, I, I don't disagree that there are maybe details that I missed out, but it's a 200 page book on a complex, complex, and a highly sentimental country, you know, and people get so passionate about it. But I must tell you, the Pakistanis who listen to Pakistani expatriates, yesterday one guy here, Stanford, uh, Silicon Valley, he wouldn't let, let me go. Three days ago, the same thing. You know, there is a community here that want to hear more like this, although I mean, they read the book may be different. But the point is that anything you say, a strong word, because I don't see another way out of changing the elite's mindset. And more and more people like you, if you write, obviously one day somebody will start thinking, okay, maybe there is a point that these guys are saying. Justifications are what they do, that's not enough. This country has tremendous potential, and it has to, otherwise it will become an major disaster for South Asia with the nuclear weapons, the way it is going, and internal rivalries, and Taliban, and you know, I just, I, I just hope for the region, in order to change the region, we need to come up with ideas, and why you are thinking this way? What is the source of these ideas? And that's the history, historical, sociological analysis can only offer that. So, I don't claim that it is a 100% accurate book, or I'm going to satisfy every military, or kind of, you know, I have returned with a purpose for us. I want you and your ex-colleagues, you I know you changed quite a bit, to rethink their national purpose of existence as a nation state. And they are bound by this typical territorial security idea of 19th century state. And that is unfortunately not helping it. So that is my push here. And I have returned with a good will, honestly. I don't want to uh, keep saying that because it has nothing to do with I, you know, my origin or anything. Because I really think that a Pakistani should have written this, but other than Aisha Siddiqui, I haven't come across anybody who's written a kind of punchy book so far. Maybe I mean, your book is on one aspect of it. Okay, that's not enough. That's just no play. Yes. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. But um, as we might have anticipated, this was a very lively session. And please join me in thanking both of our speakers.